My name is Subu, or Subramanian Lakshmanan. I'm a second year medical student at the National University of Ireland, Galway, and I'm the president of the Surgical Society there. Hello, I'm Francesca Guest. I'm an ST5 vascular registrar in the Southwest. I am the asset representative for the RULO Club, and I also sit on the National Selection Committee for ST3 recruitment into vascular and general surgical training. Hi, my name is Ellie Priestman. I'm a fourth year medical student at Bristol University. I'm also the ACIT Equality and Diversity Ambassadors co-chair, as well as being the vice president at the Bristol Women in Surgery Society. Hi, I'm Michael Okocha. I'm a general surgery registrar in the Southwest, and I'm the Association of Surgeons in Training Equality and Diversity Officer. I really hope you enjoy this episode of 50 Faces of Surgery. I hope that it leaves you feeling valued inspired and most importantly welcome here i am miss stella vig is a consultant vascular and general surgeon based in london with a specialist interest in diabetes graduating from the university of wales college of medicine in 1991 miss vig was appointed consultant at may may day university hospital in 2006. She is passionate about education and has taken on multiple roles as programme director at various stages of a surgeon's training, as well as being an honorary senior lecturer at St. George's. Beyond this, she is an active member in many societies and sits as council member for the Royal College of Surgeons of England. She's also played a key role in all party parliamentary groups for vascular, diabetes, technology and wound care. She's also the founder of the London Diabetic Foot Care, Foot Care Network and joint clinical lead for the Diabetic Foot Work Stream. Needless to say, her portfolio of research and publications is second to none, and the award she's received for her work is equally impressive. BMJ Clinical Leadership Award in 2009, ACIT's very own Silver Scalpel Award in 2018, and Asian Woman of the Year finalist in 2019. We'd like to welcome you here today, Miss Big. Yet here you are. Very much, Eddie. It's a, a pleasure to be interviewed. I thank you so much for being here. Can you just take us through your morning routine and what your everyday life is like? Um. Gosh, every morning's very different, but it's always a very early morning start. And you get into the shower in the morning, thinking about the day ahead and trying to remember all the things you need to do. And I've become more and more reliant on my mobile phone, just texting myself all the things that I really must get through that day because they, they come to me in the shower. Um, and then I've got a very short commute to work, which is about 20 minutes. Um, and then my day depends on where I am. So it's either outpatients or theatre or management meetings, but always touching base with your team, working out what's going on um, and then just planning for the day, which is always a, a long day and a rush day. And where did you grow up? So I was born in uh, Bangor, which is North Wales. And I grew up in a town called Pema Mauj which is a tiny, tiny North Wales seaside town um, with a post office and um, a supermarket and a library and a Chinese restaurant and not that much else. It, it's a tiny little place, but it's the birthplace of Gladstone, uh, who's one of the previous prime ministers. And it was a really interesting uh, place to grow up in. So we were one of the only Asian families there. We were the only Asian family in Pemmamaj. But in North Wales, we were one of the very few Asian families. And you grew up in a community that really embraced you. Um, and my aunties and uncles were all Welsh aunties and uncles, because of course my family, my extended family were all in India. So um, I had the most wonderful bringing up, really, really enjoyed my childhood. And kind of following up with that, what was life like growing up for you in that small town and just being one of the only Asian families there? It was a bit bit weird because um, I don't think I really realized I was that different. Um, there were 
there were occasional comments that reminded me that I was Asian, Indian, that weren't particularly nice comments. But actually, the majority of time I spent wanting to be the best, being allowed to be the best, and having parents who were absolutely amazing. And every time you thought, I'm not sure I can do this, we'd always say, yeah, you can, have a go. And it, as you know, it's what I always say to the trainees that come, come across my, my uh, path. Um, but mum and dad were really, really supportive. And when I decided I want to be a surgeon, which was when I was about four or five, I went to India and I met my grandmother's, my grandmother's sister, who just lost her eyesight because she'd had some cataract surgery. I made a decision that I wanted to be a surgeon because I was going to fix her and make her life wonderful. And of course, um, I then got to medical school and discovered eyes and realized they're squishy and horrible and I don't want to be anywhere near them. So still wanted to be a surgeon, but not an eye surgeon. But that was always my ambition. So when I went to school, that was always my ambition. And it was quite disappointing when I got to 16 and that was still my ambition. And I was told that wasn't what I could be because I needed to be a social worker. Because in the school I went to, there were um, only three people in the biochemistry class. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't somewhere that you um, would excel into medicine. It wasn't the normal thing through, even though it was a private school, it wasn't the normal thing for girls to go into medicine. And therefore the conversation was, you know, you should just be a social worker. And it was really my parents that supported the conversation that, you know, if she wants to be a surgeon, she wants to be a surgeon and that's what we're going to do. And I, um, if it wasn't for them, I don't think I'd be here. So I think, I think your family network and the friends that you have really influence what you do in the long term. It sounds like um, medicine started early for you at four years of age um, and you were pushed back a lot by school. What made you persist um, in going to apply for medicine? So I, I really enjoyed medicine. I enjoyed, well, not medicine, I enjoyed science. Um, I was always one of those that would take things apart and put them back together and always lost the screws and never quite got it back to normal and then would get told off. Um, so, but, but I love science and I loved the fact that you could actually make people better. And I'm one of those altruists. So, you know, even when there were, we used to have lots of cats in the house because we just lived in rural community. Um, and so, you know, when the kittens were born and they weren't well, I'd want to look after them. Cause I think you're just, you know, the, the whole conversation when you go to med school, which is don't say you want to be there to look after people. But generally most of us do so that was really what I wanted to do so I, I couldn't see myself doing anything else early and um, so I applied first time and I didn't get my grades so I um, I managed to completely bomb out on my chemistry I got a D and of course the offer was uh, a B uh, a and two B's and I didn't get in first time and for the first time ever we went up to London from North Wales with my dad and we walked around every London medical school uh, saying you know my dad saying my daughter wants to do medicine we haven't got the grades what can she do and of course there was no way you could get in with those grades so I got ABD first time round. so I actually resat my chemistry did further pure maths and actually really grew up in that year so I think when when things hit you and you think that they they're going really badly my father always used to say to me, Stel, things happen for a reason, don't worry. And it would really irritate me. But I'm now beginning to say to my children as well, because actually it's true. Um, when you sit back and think, if I'd got into medical school that first time round, I think I would have been quite immature. Um, I actually jumped a year at school, so I was a year ahead of myself. And I think I was actually quite immature and I don't think I would have enjoyed medical school. But actually going the year later, I had the most amazing time in Cardiff. So I think the, the conversation again is about resilience and believing in yourself, but that's hard when you're 15, 16, 17. You know, it's hard even now. And the question for all of us is how do we support our colleagues to really believe in themselves? Um, you know, the, the medical students that come and do clinical observerships with us and, and spend some time. How do you support them and tell them your story so they know you don't have to be top of the class all the time to get in. You know, normal people get in. People like us get in. It's a really heartwarming thing to hear. Um, 
with regards to your actual training, where did where did you go for that? So I, I started off in, so I was born in North Wales and North Wales to South Wales is a very, very long way away. And my parents said I had to go, had to be close to home. So Wales was close to home, but it was long enough and far enough away that they would have to give me notice to come down, which is really important. So anyone listening to this, really important point. Make sure you, you're far enough away so your parents need to give you notice. So anyway, so I went to South Wales, I went to Cardiff and um, we had an interesting degree. So the first two years we were with everybody else. So we weren't with medics, we were with, we live with everybody and, and engineers and all sorts. And they of course were on three year degrees, but it gave you, gave you a really good insight into other people rather than just medics. So we were in the social uh, with everyone else. And then the last three years, we went to medical school at sort of up in the University of Wales hospital. And there we were then living with medics most of the time. And the um, and I did an integrated year. Um, so I worked through school, uh, med school. Uh, I did silver service waitressing and all sorts of things because at that point we were on grants and you had to sort of earn some extra money because mom and dad weren't that well off. And, um, but, but I worked hard, played hard, failed exams, passed exams, did the kind of things that everyone used to do, uh, enjoyed clubbing, enjoyed, oh my God, all sorts of things, but had a really good time. And I think it's important that you remember that medicine's not just about learning medicine. Your degree course is about learning to be you and becoming you and, and growing up and having relationships and, and you know, just finding the kind of friends that are with you then for the rest of your life and I met the most amazing people Ellie who are still friends um, and of course the world of medicine is very small as well so people who were my SHOs um, and registrars and they're, they're still around and they're still people that support me and look after me um, and, and it's really funny when we all get together again because we act like we were SHOs again. And of course we're not, we're actually grown up people. <laughs> but, but I had a fantastic time in Cardiff. Really recommend it as a degree course if you want to do it there. And in your introduction, we discussed that you were appointed consultant in 2006. What was the first week of being a consultant like? Uh, scary. Um, and so, so I'd been a registrar in, Car in um, Croydon, which is the Mayda University Hospital. So I was a, the registrar there and I went away, did my training and then obviously came back as a consultant. And the very first day I was there, so when you start as a, as a houseman or as an F a foundation trainee, you have your bleep and it's the most scary thing in the world. Well, I can tell you when you become a first day consultant, it's still the scariest thing in the world. And I was thinking, God, my bleep's gonna go off and I'm gonna get called for something and I won't know what to do. So anyway, my bleep went off as I was walking down the corridor and um, it was switchboard. And they said, is that Miss Fig? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? First call when I'm a consultant. Um, and they said, you know, is that Miss Fig who was our registrar? And I said, yes. And they said, it's lovely to have you back. So that was literally my first day in the hospital. And the other thing, Ellie, that I think I remember about my first week was just the support of my consultant colleagues who said to me, first six months, you're going to see stuff you've never seen before. You're going to be asked to give a review on things you've never seen before. And if you need to ask for help, shout and we will come. And actually, I never needed them in the first six months. I, I, I had conversations and we, we discussed lots of things, but I never really needed them to operate on someone but just the knowledge that if I needed them, they'd be there, meant that I felt really safe being a first year consultant. And that's the advice I now give to anyone who's starting with us. Um, you know, whether you're a foundation trainee or an SHO registrar consultant, whoever you are, wherever you start, it feels very different. Um, and you need to know there are people to go to if you need to. And sometimes you, you, know, you have trainees who start who for some reason, talk to you, feel more secure with you. And they might be on with a different consultant who they feel more uncomfortable with. Well, there is also no harm in saying to them, you know, if you just want to run that patient through with me before you phone the other boss, please do. Because it just allows them to have a conversation. But, but I think working, the working environment needs to be a supportive environment. And I say, I've been really lucky that not always, 
but a lot of the time I've had a very supportive environment. You said you haven't always had a supportive environment. And I guess that leads on to our, our next question, which is what challenges have you faced along your journey? Michael, I think when you when you start, I think the conversation is always if you're and, and this is very this is very personal to me. You know, I started in Wales and in um, 1984, there were no female consultant colleagues as far as I could see. There were no female surgeons in Wales. And when I went to the first WIS meeting in 1991, I was so excited to see female surgeons as consultants. I thought that was absolutely incredible. And I actually made a decision the Christmas of my, my houseman year. So of course that was a, a long time ago, but Christmas of houseman year, there were no females around and I made a decision. I wasn't going to do surgery. I was going to do medicine because I just couldn't see how it would work. And in the back of my mind, I wanted to have children and I just couldn't really see how this was going to work. Um, and in that first six months, my boss, Kieran Horgan, actually introduced me to my husband, who is my research registrar. So we started going out and he also wanted to do surgery. And that sort of also had the conversation of two surgeons in the family. Again, this is just mad now. We really, really, it's just not going to work. So I, I had a conversation with Kieran Horgan. So in the old days now, we used to have a social on site at, at, uh, at um, uh, at the UHW at the University Hospital of Wales and we used to do the 10 o'clock IVs um, which of course all the nurses do now and so our conversation would always be we'd work really hard on the ward clear the decks and then we'd go down to the social to have something to eat um, and of course there'd be people there drinking you wouldn't drink because you were on call but actually the camaraderie there was really good and then we would come back to do all the 10 o'clock IVs and that would take us forever to do them. But I was in, in, the, um, in the social with Kieran Horgan uh, coming up to Christmas and he said, Stel, so what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to do medicine now because I can't see anyone being in front of me. And he said, if you want to do surgery, get on and do it because if you don't reach for the stars, you'll never know where you may have got. And you will always live your life regretting that you did it. So because of that conversation, I then applied to the Perry Fellowship SHO programme and, and off I went from there. Um, and then of course I met Avril Mansfield in, um, in London because I went, came up to the college to, to the WIST uh, and thought she was amazing. Um, and then became the first female Calman appointee in, in Wales. Now, there was a, a registrar who came to Wales who was pregnant, who sadly was unwell for a lot of her pregnancy. So when I then got married and had children, there was a lot of pressure on me being the first female pregnant registrar um, on the rotation and it, it felt like there was a lot of pressure Michael and I took I took 12 weeks off for both pregnancies which I wouldn't advocate for anyone um, I, I went off uh, three days before my first one and the day before I delivered my second one and it was uh, and you did 12 weeks and you came back to work and Gina you made it work but for anyone now, whether you're male or female, and you're, you're, you know, you want to have the, the role as a, a mother or a father, you know, you should just be allowed to enjoy it. And there's plenty of time to do that and go less than full time for whatever reason, not just childcare, lots and lots of things you can do. But I think, Michael, what that made me think, whether it was right or not, was that I had to be 120 percent all the time. So I worked hard, did my anything I could have done, I tried to do early, um, whether it's papers or, you know, anything really, just to make sure that you didn't get the block, which was the glass ceiling that stopped you. But it was interesting, even having done that, getting to a consultant post was a really difficult time. And I actually almost gave up. Um, and I decided um, just after I got my, I finished my CCT, uh, and my, my, my registrar rotation, I actually made a decision to go into pharma. And the reason I did that were that there were no jobs in London. My husband had already got a job in London and I couldn't see, couldn't find a job, couldn't see where I was gonna work. There were jobs for the boys, but there was no job earmarked for me. And I suddenly felt I was quite stranded. So I made a decision to leave medicine. I was going to leave surgery. 
um, because I wanted to be with my husband. I had two children by then. And Alison Halliday, who's the professor of vascular surgery, actually found me and said, Stel, uh, you mustn't leave. Something will come up, you mustn't leave. And she actually really supported me in the, it was about six months before I found my job at Croydon, um, really supported me with that kind of mental thing, which is you've done so much, you've done your, your MD, you've done so much, why would you now leave? But Michael, it was an honest thought and I almost did. That's really empowering and we are grateful that you didn't leave. <laughs> um, so you've spoken about the supports that other people have given you. Were there any other things that you used to support yourself? Any intrinsic things that you said to yourself or mantras to keep you going? Michael, Michael I've been really lucky all the way through. So my um, husband, as I say, is, a, is, is also a surgeon. And we, apart from about 18 months when I was in Cardiff and he was in London, we've actually lived quite close to each other. So we've managed to balance the childcare and work out a year in advance whose rotor's doing what. And um, because he's been more senior, you know, if the little ones were unwell, I knew I was gonna have to take time off work. But my sister, I've got a, a baby, well, when I say baby sister, she's 40 something, but I've got my little sister who um, in my early years, Michael, was just incredible. Because when I had a theatre list and my husband had a theatre list, my sister would step in and help. Um, my parents are wonderful, Nupi's parents are wonderful. And so we were really lucky that we had that network. And there are lots of people who are single or you know have parents who are abroad or the other side of the country, and that makes it really difficult. And COVID's made it even more difficult for people. So I've been really lucky with that network, but also I've been really lucky that the, the kind of mutual aid conversation, which is, you know, you look after each other and you become that family. Um, I've been really lucky to have people who I've worked with uh, who have really helped. Um, and and the, <laughs> the conversation of uh, make sure you've got a work-life balance is really, really important. But my conversation with everyone is that work-life balance has to be what you set itself up as because for some people that means that you do a little bit for other people it's that you work hard and I think for me the busier I am the happier I am so I think I think that kind of resilience conversation is if you feel well and whatever you're doing um, makes you feel good keep doing it but if you're struggling to get into work and struggling to write a paper and just stop, take something out because there is plenty of time to do stuff. You don't have to do it all in the same time. Lifetime's a huge amount of time. Um, and so set your work-life balance to what suits you. That's really important. Something I am still trying to learn. <laughs> so am I, Michael. <laughs> um, can I ask, has there been a career defining moment? Maybe it was, you know, someone challenged you or something happened or you were scrubbed in theatre. Has there been a moment in which you, you felt something changed or changed your trajectory? So I think there's been lots of things that are, I think you start on a straight path and then things knock you from one side to the other and you, you sort of end up just following whatever mother nature set out for you. Um, but I think that the, when, so when you ask the question, the thing that immediately springs to mind is when I had my, um, my neurosurgery. So you work hard and as you work hard, you know, not that you guys have got to there, but as you get older, you feel a bit more tired. Your energy seems to just disappear a little bit. There's lots of things going on. And I was getting more and more tired, couldn't quite work out what was going on. Um, really weird sensation. I just felt like I was always, I know it sounds really silly, but out of my body. So it felt like I was looking at things just from a, from a slightly different plane. It was very odd sensation. Um, and I discussed it with people, nobody could work out what was going on. And then I started to become really, really clumsy in my shoes. So as you know, I always wear high heels and, and I was just beginning to fall over. It was, it was very strange. My writing became quite Parkinson-like. And um, I went to see one of my consultant colleagues because I, um, I had got very, very dizzy. 
Um, and they did a CT scan and I had a, a quite a large uh, acoustic neuroma. So there was then a conversation about a six month pause in what I was doing. And that felt really uncomfortable because nothing had made me stop in that way. So even having baked children, I, I hadn't really stopped. But suddenly I was out of work for six months and having to do things. And of course, I was desperate to came, come back. So I came back at about four months and did more and more management. And I think that kind of experience makes you stop and look at what you've got and what you have and where you want to be. And I think COVID has done the same. So COVID again has made me pause for a second time. And, you know, Ellie, thank you for being so lovely about, you know, me when I first started, but, you know, I, there, I, I enjoy doing lots and lots of things. But what I've realized now is that when you start off being a surgeon and that defines you, it's not what defines you at the end, because actually you become a manager and an educator and a researcher and all, you know, all the things you do and a mum and a dad and everything else that I think now my, I think, and it started really when I had my acoustic neuroma because I then became the uh, clinical divisional lead um, or clinical uh, director. I think that opened my eyes to more and more management. And I think that's probably where I will go as, as time goes on. So I think that's now shoved me in a unique direction that Michael, I would never ever have said I was going to do, but it's exciting, um, completely different. But the clinical voice in the room full of managers is so important. And COVID I think has shown us more than ever that the clinical change that we can make and drive where we understand patients and clinicians and the environment we work, work in and have known for a very, very long time gives us such a unique strength that drives healthcare and we mustn't lose it. And, and we also, Michael, it shouldn't be that you only do that when you're you know, senior, senior. That should be everything that we're all involved in right from the very beginning. Yet, here you are. If you could go back in time, what would you say to yourself in order to inspire and, and motivate you? Um, hmm. So I would say choose your speciality because of what you can see it become rather than the people that you work with. So I fell in love with my two consultant vascular surgeon colleagues. I thought they were amazing. Um, Ahmed Shandal, who um, was in Newport, um, and Ian Lane. Ahmed Shandal in particular, he could smell an aneurysm in the ambulance, Francesca. He knew it was coming. And so you just get a call from him saying, Stel, there's an aneurysm downstairs. You think, How do you know? Because I've not even had a call. But he had so much energy. Ian Lane was the same. Ian Lane's work was precise um, and he was a, a great surgeon. But I loved the way they lived their lives and that's what I wanted to do. Did I forecast that in 25 years of my clinical practice that it would become more interventional radiology and more endovascular? It, it's, you know, I don't mind doing it, but it's not what I set out to do. And I think when you start your careers, you need to think about the innovation and change that can occur in the lifetime of yourselves. And some of it's difficult to predict, but look at the horizon and talk to you know, your colleagues about what is coming through because you need to be ready for that as well. I think the second thing for me, Francesca, is if anyone gives you a project to do, literally draw a cross and the cross needs to have on that axis, um, difficult, well, easy to difficult. And on that axis needs to be the time you're gonna invest. And anything that's easy and is a short time frame, say yes to it, get on with it. Anything that's in the difficult box and it's gonna take a long time, park it, <laughs> don't do it. So I think there are so many projects I started and never finished Francesca that um, some of them I should have done and some of them I shouldn't have started. But I think invest your time well in what you want to do, whether it's research or audit, you know, anything you do, invest your time so that it actually drives what you want it to drive rather than what everybody else wants 
to do around you. Um, and I think the third thing for me is just enjoy life. You know, someone asks you to do something and you want to do it, just say yes and get on with it. And if you want to do something and you don't, not sure or don't believe you can, just have a go. Um, because it, it's incredible how much support you will get if you say yes and actually you say, I'm not sure how to do it, but I would love to do it. People will find a way to support you doing it. That's fantastic. Um, have you got any advice uh, for medical students and aspiring surgeons? So Francesca, recently I've been giving, um, as, I, as I always do, lots of medical student talks to surgical societies. And what's really sad to hear still are the conversations of, can I have children? The questions I used to ask in 1991. I mean, they really need to stop now. Can I have children? Can I get married? Can I do anything apart from surgery? Um, is it going to be all assuming and, you know, I, I just cannot do anything else with my life? The answer is no. Medicine is there as a passport to the world. You can do anything you want with it. Surgery gives you an even, it gives you a first class passport. All right. You can do any speciality, anything you want in any country if you decide that's what you want to do. And whether that's charitable, whether it's private, whether it's going off and developing a surgical app, there are so many things you do with your surgical passport. The other conversation that keeps coming up is, um, do I need to be posh? And do I need to look like some of the pictures on the walls of the College of Surgeons? Uh, the answer is absolutely not. You need to look like you. You're unique. So if anyone tries to label me as Welsh or Indian or a female or a mother or a surgeon or anything else they want to label me as, well, they've got it wrong because I'm not those. What I am is a complete mix of everything. And the experiences that we've just discussed make me who I am. So you can't be me because you haven't got my, you weren't born in Panama and you haven't got my experiences. So you can't be me, but you can be you. And bringing you into medicine and bringing you into surgery is just so powerful and fantastic and is a role model for other people that come through. So if you really are thinking of doing medicine or surgery, um, just get on with it because um, you just need to be you and you need to be normal. Everything else works around it. 